you can just uh, see how many people are already familiar with this logic pad. And you don't have to be an expert, you know, whatever background, I'm not sure for all. Prashant, did you what, did you give a talk on this at BlizzCon before I S U S? I would ask you why. Okay. <coughs> okay. So the logic paradigm for C plus plus. Mm. So we are actually going to be talking about uh, a general purpose mechanism for decla uh, for declarative programming. Uh, I should say to declare the facility for general purpose programming. Okay. So the main term here is declare the programming. What we're dealing with here is what you want done, not how to do it. So you have these uh, SQL, HTML. These are actually all domain specific uh, programming mechanism or uh, declare the facility. The logic pattern is actually a general purpose facility. Now, there is a predicate calculus which is actually driving the this paradigm, which basically has been proven to be Turing complete. So basically, what that means is you can compute a value imperatively, you can compute it declaratively in this paradigm. Prolog and Godel are the some common examples of these languages. Prolog was actually the one that pioneered this uh, paradigm. <coughs> this is the basic structure of the talk. I'm going to start with some introduction <coughs> to the basic, uh, you know, the fundamental uh, concepts behind this. Move on to actually representing those concepts in code, and then we'll actually, uh, you know, uh, see some uh, live code. This is in the early stages of uh, the boost process, so I don't know. Uh, you know, maybe someday it might make it. Actually, what I forgot to point out was we're, I'm going to be using a library called Caster, which is all that you need. You don't need any uh, compiler extensions. So it's pure header library, and that's all you basically need for anything you see in this talk. There are two points I'm basically trying to drive. One is that uh, LP is a general purpose paradigm, and the second is that, uh, second to show you multi paradigm programming. Because I'm not actually trying to tell you to start exclusively uh, writing in this paradigm, but uh, mix, mix the paradigms. So here's an interesting question. Why are most languages imperative? You, you, you've seen this talk before. <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know what your answer was before. Okay. I mean, I, I think it's because the underlying machine is imperative, and it's it's just a less of a less of a leap from there to something. Like, you know, I mean, people think they started programming in machine code and thought, well, if only I could do something a little bit more. You know, incrementally from there, so they so they still think imperatively. Or was the computer built imperatively? Think imperatively? Yeah, I mean, that's that's probably that too. You. Know? So yeah, that's basically the idea. The hardware is imperative, and the languages are basically oh, abstractions on top of it. And uh, so whatever languages you have are basically abstracting that you know the fundamental machine's uh, mechanism of behavior, and that's where we get our uh, imperative languages. And what's the key weakness of uh, declarative languages? You cannot directly execute uh, selective uh, selective updates. Selective variable. updates, okay. Let's say performance in terms of issue. Okay. No, so you can express algorithms. Okay. So here, basically, I think uh, I mean these are all reasonable answers, but I think the key problem with declarative programming is the fact that you don't have control of how things are done. Right? You just say saying what you want done. This is actually brings me to what's the you know, key weakness of the imperative model. You have to tell everything. Exactly. So you can see that these two are sort of a complement to each other. One forces you to say everything that needs to be done. 
the other one doesn't give you that. So basically the idea is that when you want to take control, you do it imperatively. And when you don't, you do it declaratively. So it's sort of in a, it's an actual threat in that sense. So I talked about the predicate calculus which is purely complete. And uh, this being a declarative paradigm. And this basically, this idea of uh, general purpose declarative programming is uh, often called as the holy grail of uh, programming where the user simply states what to be done and the computer simply figures out how to do it. And LP is only one approach. Efficiently. What's that? How's the computer solves it efficiently. Solves it. That'd be step one. What's that? Step, step one is solve it. Solve it, exactly. Very efficiently. Premature optimization. Okay. I think the, uh, your uh, TM guys will tell you all that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> then we all lose our jobs? Yeah. Yeah, good chance. But we, we get to the job of stating the problem well. Well, you just give this to your manager and he'll start you know, writing an LP, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the basic mechanics, so now that you're actually not describing how to do the job, you still have to provide some information to the machine, and basically this mechanism providing this information to the machine in this paradigm is the, through this uh, concept called relations. Okay, we look into that. And then once all that information about the problem domain has been given, Right? Then there's a universal problem solving facility which is applied by the machine. And that's actually a combination of these two steps. It's basically backtracking and unification. We'll actually look at all this stuff. But generally, think of this as, you know, if your manager comes and tells you to get some stuff done, he'll give you enough information and it's up to you to figure out how to get the job done. So the first concept is that of a relation. And before I talk about relation, there's a more fundamental concept is that of a set. A set is a collection of unique objects. Unique I put in brackets because you know often in practice you relax this constraint, like in the relational databases model. You cannot duplicate records. So I have two sets here, people and gender set. Okay, so I'm introducing some theory here. It won't be too much. So just very simple. Um, so we have the two sets here. And now, if I associate the people to their gender, I get a bunch of arrows, right? So those that collection of arrows is your relation. In this case, it's a binary relation. Okay, very simple. Is there arrows or missing something? Uh, arrows. <laughs> um, those are lines. <laughs> those are not arrows. <laughs> So actually, the fact that they are not arrows is important because there's no direction in the world. Okay, you can, uh, it's just an association problem. Now, I can represent the collection of uh, lines as also a set, right? As a set of pairs because it's a binary relation. So basically, you basically come down to the idea that you know, even a relation is a set. So a relation is basically a set. You can, if you think of this as mappings between sets, association basically between them, it really helps you when you express the relations in code. And uh, the concept of a relation is as fundamental to this paradigm as functions are to the imperative model. Okay. So let's take a look at how you would implement this using functions. So you, here you have this relation. You have a simple function here, check gender given a person P and G. It tells me whether it's in that relation. Given a person P, it returns me the gender of that person. And given a gender G, it gives me all the people who have that gender. So these are basically primitive relations, uh, primitive functions around that one relation. And this one basically enumerates everything. Right? So these are sort of primitive stuff. Enumerates everything in the world? In this relation, it's basically saying, "Give me all, give me, give me all the p's and g's there. Give me all the." So it's like select star from. Okay, I, all right. I'd like to see gender in its name, if that's okay. Okay. Oh, get items. You mean? Yeah. It just seems so. Oh, you can say get people, get gender, or get people's gender, whatever. Okay. Right. 
I'd also like gender to be an enum instead of a string, but you know, I wasn't even saying that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, how many members would that enum have in it? At least three, yeah. Okay. Uh, which one? Trans. So here, uh, what I'm doing is representing that stuff actually has no relation, okay? Now, first thing you see that a relation itself is being def uh, declared as a function. Uh, when you see a function whose return type is relation, you know it's actually a relation. <coughs> it's a binary relation, so it has two uh, arguments. Strings, both are strings, uh, because that's what I chose to be. Uh, you could have enums. And both those types are actually tagged with this template called LREF, logic reference. Okay, so LREF is basically you can semantically think of it as references in C++, but the only difference being that they may not be initialized. Okay, just for uh, high level, basically they just part pointers. So the, the, this part is important in the declarative programming. It's called the declarative reading. This is how you read this. Line. You just say P is gender is G. Okay. So now I'm going to show you how to implement this stuff. And before I show you what's actually happening, let me read this out. So you would say, you start from here, P is gender is G. If P is equal to Frank, G is equal to male, or P is equal to Sam, and so forth. So what you see is we've actually only represented the information from that uh, from here, right? There's no ifs, for loops, no that stuff. No data structures. This is there are many ways to do it. This is just a simple. Uh, so <coughs> what I'm going to be actually talking about in this first part right now, you can think of this as the hello world of the logic paradigm. Okay, this is mostly to uh, <coughs> make you get you a feel of the concepts. So one. Specification is declarative. Now the interesting part is the second bullet that this one relation actually subsumes the functionality of all the four uh, functions that we saw earlier. So let me show you how this works. Okay, before that, let me talk about this EQ briefly. EQ is actually the unification part of that backtracking and unification I talked about earlier. What EQ does is basically try to make these two arguments equal. Okay. So remember I said P may or may not be initialized because it's an LRA. So if P is not initialized, P will be assigned front, and then those two are equal, and that would return true. But if P is already initialized, these will be compared. And if you know the comparison is successful, it runs true, otherwise false. So same with the other stuff. So seems like a lot. Instead of using uh, relations, um, you could uh, also use uh, functions or uh, functions instead. For example, a function jump, uh, gender off, and use uh, maybe a terrible writing and uh, narrowing to, to, to because relations are uh, when, when we, uh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, <coughs> Sometimes the a function is more uh, adapted to, to what, what we want to, to say. For example, uh, two times it is more clear as a function than as a, a relation. <coughs> and, uh, okay. So, uh, so first basically what I'm going to do here is take this relation and make it behave like all those four functions, right? Basically answer the fundamental questions that I can ask around that uh, relation, right? So here my first question is, is Sam male? And uh, all I'm doing is, you know, calling gender with those two arguments. Now what I'm doing here is actually just passing the arguments, That's, this is called invocation, and now 
I'm going to trigger the uh, so what I'm doing here is evaluation so what happened in the first statement was that no evaluation happened only the arguments were bound to the relation and in the second statement the machinery is put into action and then that's where uh, that's where you basically uh, so what I'm saying is if Sam is made then print yes okay so I'm just gonna run that right so the next thing I'm gonna do is uh, do the next uh, ask the next question so what is uh, Sam's gender so now instead of actually specifying his gender, I just leave it un unspecified. Uh, it's called undefined. The value is undefined. And then print the uh, value of G. Is that visible, the stuff at the bottom? Yes. Okay, so it says male. Now, I'm going to ask the other question. Who are all the males? Uh, sorry. Right? So, I just leave it unspecified. And now I will just print P. And uh, it says Frank. But actually, there is more than one male in the system. And the way you sort of iterate over all the solutions is just to use a the natural looping constructs that we already have in C++, which is a, a loop. And now it actually gives you all the answers. So now let me just tell you how this all works. <laughs> OK? Um, so when I invoke this relation, when I invoke this relation, I get back this as an expression tree in here, OK? Where P, uh, well, let's start with Sam. Okay, so I get this guy, with P is fixed to Sam, and G is fixed to male. So just imagine this whole thing substituted with Sam and male. So unification, when you trigger this evaluation, this, each clause is evaluated one by one. And any, if any one succeeds, the whole expression is su successful. So what you do here is first do this part here, in the first clause. That fails. So by short circuit evaluation, you skip that. This one will succeed because Sam compares with Sam, right? So at that point, it will uh, move on here. And then again, male unifies with male. And that, so you have a successful clause, and that returns. So if you have the raised statement there, it comes back here and prints the value. Okay? Let's do the next one. So all the operators are overloaded and everything, so you can't... Not all, there's just two operators required. <laughs> well, we'll get to it. So, um, so what's happening here is, now we've left this unspecified. Sam is specified. So now here, this is all Sam. <coughs> so this part of the expression tree, <coughs> this rectangle here, is going to be doing comparison, and this will be doing assignment, right? So this clause will fail for the same reason. This succeeds. Now this assigns to G, and you come back. And uh, now the interesting thing actually happens is in this particular case, uh, we are looking for all males. Right? So if you're looking for all males, you're just printing out. So in the previous cases, there was only one solution, right? In the second case, there's multiple solutions. So when you are, in the previous case, you would typically use an if statement just because you have one. And because you have more than one, you would use a while loop. Now, when you use the while loop, 
first time the trigger, uh, you know, the evaluation is triggered, you basically go to the first mail. So P is assigned prime, P is assigned the value prime, and G is compared with mail. So the first one succeeds. Comes back, prints the value, goes back into the while loop. Now, this clause will be given a second chance to see if there's more values, if it can generate. At this point in time, it knows that there's no more values that this clause can generate. So EQ knows that P has been previously assigned the value for I. It takes this opportunity to undo that. And this guy has nothing to undo. Then you, for, uh, you move on to the second clause. This one will now assign Sam to P. Okay? Do you see that? Now what actually happens is, let's say if you're over here, the first two clauses will not be considered the next time the while loop comes in. Okay, it resumes at the third clause. It will not repeat the first two clauses. This is basically backtracking. You basically leave out what you've already covered and sort of proceed for the remaining ones. Okay. So, where is that state preferred? Where is the? The state. The state? The state is inside the here. Pay, inside of pay or inside of AM? Say that again. Inside of pay or inside of AM? Which state? That pay has already been evaluated in the second Okay, so we'll see how that uh, whole thing is. This is all the whole thing is actually behind the scenes. And, uh, okay, so, so everything actually, okay, we'll get to that. So you could do this. Now here, one other thing I could just, just to show you that, uh, you know, you could do this IO here if you wish to. Just print P there. Okay, and then just do nothing in the while loop. Okay, that'll do the same uh, job. I need to put spaces, but uh, it basically prints out all the values. So let's recap uh, what we've, and, uh, well before we recap, there's one more important thing I need to show you, uh, and that's recursion. So we are just basically at this moment building up basic concepts so that we can do some something useful later on. Sorry, can I ask one question? Sure. Uh, the, the second last line in the last example, so basically, it goes down to yeah. Frank. No, with the with the gentleman. Oh, sorry. Yeah, with the gentleman. Right. So it goes down to Mary, right? And uh, right. It, it succeeds. Comes, you know. It succeeds. It succeeds. Right? <coughs> this fails. This fails. So the, the so this guy uh, so there's a the and operator has been defined that when this fails, this guy gets another chance. So he resets the value and comes back. Okay. okay, we'll see how the operators right. are defined yeah. also. So by and large, you, if you're just reading a declarer, it just simply makes sense what's supposed to happen, that happens. I mean, you guys are more experts, so you kind of want to know what's really happening. I'll get to that. So I've added some more extra relations here. I'm just building up more information. The first one is child. I'm just saying C is, uh, you know, Sam is child of Mary, Dennis is child of Mary, uh, Sam is child of Frank, and so forth. Next is a father relation. F is the father of C if F is male and C is child of L. So I'm building up on the earlier relations now. Mother is the same idea, basically only the gender is different. Now parent is either a father or a mother, right? And uh, I could actually simplify this as follows also. I could just say, you know, flip the arguments to child because parent is basically inverse of child, uh, the, the relation. 
Now here's the interesting part, ancestor, because now you have to go arbitrarily high into the, you know, the ancestry. So what I'm saying is A is an ancestor of B if A is parent of B or A is parent of some X. A is parent of some X and X happens to be an ancestor of B. So here's the recursive part. If you're an immediate parent, then that's fine, you're the ancestor. Otherwise, you have to, so what this is going to do, remember, if you leave this value unspecified, it's going to generate values, right? So when the value is generated, we consume that over here and generate values for D, or it could be testing D, depending on if D is uh, initialized or not. Now there's one little issue with this particular ancestor definition. So the one little issue here is, it's semantically correct, but there's one little C++ thingy happening here. So when I invoke this relation over here, I don't want any, I just want this whole expression tree back, right? But what actually happens is we have an immediate invocation for, to ancestor all over again. So that expression tree never comes back here. You see that? There's infinite recursion here. So the way you break it is you just say it recurs. That's basically an adapter that defers the recursion. Okay, so that's it. And uh, I'm gonna just, this is gonna give me all ancestors of Sam. Uh, that should be actually two people in the way I have defined. Uh, is his Frank is his mother, Mary is the mother. Uh, Frank is the father, Mary is the mother, and Gary is the grandparent. Okay. Did you ever think about uh, building laziness into these relations so that you can have to explicitly say recurse? There, uh, there are several options that were considered and everything has a deeper impact somewhere else. So, you know, you might fix something here, but break something else elsewhere. So, the basic idea is that uh, you are just binding arguments <coughs> at this point. You're just doing invocations and deferring the invocation. So it seemed like a, this, fixing this problem this way seemed like a better solution than patching the other stuff that happens as opposed to, you know, what things can happen and so So you can see there's no bind basically here. You don't have to keep saying bind, bind, bind. Right, you just stated. Uh, I have a, a prologue book from 1980 something, huh? which I always found kind of interesting. All it, prologue books are from 1980. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's true, and you know, when I and I, and I read it, you know, and I, once in a while, if I'm going to the John, I'll thumb through. It. <laughs> but because it's, I, you know, I've, I've always found it. I've always actually found it very intriguing. And when I look at this, it seems to me that just reading that book, you could, uh, it seems like there's an absolutely one-to-one -one correspondence <coughs> between the, the, the descriptions in that book and what you're, what you're doing here. I mean, it seems like I could pick up that book and uh, with almost nothing extra do exactly what, what we're doing here. Is it, it, did you consciously make it look exactly like Prologue? Actually, this looks a little bit different. Uh, the way it's the syntax is a little bit different. Uh, this particular example is very identical to some of those early examples you see in the. Oh, uh, maybe that's it, huh? Yeah. So that actually, this is like a classical hello world of the uh, logic paradigm. But there are subtle semantics that come later on. I don't get into those right now uh -huh. because it's only for people who thoroughly understand it, and I'm not <laughs> among themselves. Yeah. Probably uh, meaning I understand it well enough, but. Uh, the certain interesting things when you start implementing those semantics in C++, in particular unification that has some efficiency issues, uh, which you have to pay for even if you're not using them. So there's some subtler, uh, you can't just take those prologue programs and stick it. Okay, so, so this, uh, and that's really, I guess, my question. It's not really a re-implementation of prologue in our world here. It's, it's something that's prologue-like, so... It's basically, you can think of, you know, when you bring the logic, uh, the functional programming into C++ with Lambda, you don't call it Lisp, uh, Lisp in C++. Yeah. It's functional paradigm for C++. So okay. this is basically an attempt to bring those ideas, whether it's from prologue or whatever. Well, so far, it's right. like a one-to-one -one map. But yeah, so far, it's actually one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so, okay, so we got the recursion in place. Uh, so that actually covers most of the stuff that the basics I wanted to cover, and basically you're good to go from here, uh, from what you need to understand to start using this. Okay, so there are a few things that we uh, saw that uh, relations have a very simple syntax. We just, uh, you know, define them as functions. Uh, we were able to simply use a loop to iterate over all solutions, which is the most natural construct for us in, uh, you know, an imperative uh, paradigm. You didn't have to write any classes to define your relations, no templates, you know, syntax is really clean. Uh, no macros. Now, the other interesting thing about this syntax is once you can define your relations as simply as functions, you can also make them member functions. You can make them pure virtual, virtual whatever. You can make them callbacks. So basically, you take all those design patterns that you have today, and you sort of extend them into this paradigm. Okay, whether you can do CRTP, you can templatize them, you know, whatever. Excuse me. I, I would add to what Robert said, the only difference between this and Prolog so far is that Prolog had a fantastically simpler interface language. Absolutely. You know, basically that's what happens when you do functional programming in C++. You know, you can't beat Haskell ever. Uh, you know, like the, like the syntax I'm talking about, with the, like bind for instance, if you wanted to bind with Haskell, it's so simple, you can just say plus and uh, pass it around. And it's kind of, you don't have to say bind plus and create a, uh, something out of it. So I mean, when you have Prolog which is natively supporting that, naturally you get better support. <coughs> you have the ability to extend C++, you'll get even better support, potentially. Uh, I mean, actually, I didn't want to say anything, but now it's been opened. You know, I, I take this because the concept is one, almost one-to-one -to, -one to Prolog. The syntax is a little bit out there, but just in the other section across the lawn, it looks like you got this, that part of the solution right going on, right there. Yeah, yeah I think it is. Uh, and this particular syntactic style that I'm using here is borrowed from another language called Lida. Yeah. Um, I didn't invent this, but I was aiming to achieve the same because all the solutions I've looked at involve others, you know, trying to get the prolog syntax, it involves macros, and you just can't read them. Yeah. Um, well, I was thinking of, of Eric's domain-specific uh, uh, languages, which has been used to do a couple things. And, although, actually, I, to me, I find this really readable, so I don't have a problem yeah, with it. I was going to say, I, I, I don't know what more you can no, get. I, I, I mean, don't think it, he has an issue with Do you have an issue with readability, me. or you just think the problem no, has no, it? No, no, I think it's quite oh. readable. Yeah, I, mean, I think okay, that's what saying that day. Your comment suggested that it paled in comparison to something else. Oh, I, I didn't mean that. Yeah. It's not the syntax. Okay, it's so... So I'm going to just talk about how this whole stuff is put in place in this library. So this is the core part of Caster, and there's three primitive <coughs> that are making all this happen. And one is a logic reference type, as we saw, it is simply a smart pointer. Then there's type erasure happening, and there's, for that we have type relation, which makes it all easy to consume and uh, sort of uh, the syntax keeps the syntax simple. And third is core routines. Uh, how many of you are not familiar with Coroutine? One, two, three. So Coroutines are sort of a sibling of subroutines. We're always using subroutines in our programs. Uh, I'll get into that a little bit later on. But you can see that these three, when you look at them, it doesn't make any sense that you could build logic paradigm out of this. And they're about, you know, maybe three, four hundred lines of code. On top of that, we have the unification relation and these operators. Okay, we have seen these two. These are classically well, uh, used in the logic uh, paradigm, but these two have been introduced specifically in Castor. Now, I'll get into those semantics a little bit later on, but the. The important thing is that these operators and that unification relation is nothing but ordinary relations. Just what you would write like ancestor or parent. So basically on top of this, you just have ordinary relations. 
building up the pan line. Okay. So it's a very super lightweight implementation. Even the operators I'll show you are really simple. <coughs> Let me cover this L ref and some of these primitives first. So we've seen it's uh, basically a smart pointer. Uh, it may not be initialized. And if you try to dereference it, when it's not initialized, it throws an exception. Uh, one thing that's coming new into Castor is the ability to make the LREF point to an existing object, potentially on the stack or wherever, that, so that it doesn't manage it. So you just say, you know, LREF take the address of i. Whenever you give it a pointer, you have to say whether or not you want it to be managed. Okay? This is clear? So that what you're saying is basically I'm going to take up ownership of that object. So basically, you can take an existing vector or something, you know, take it to the logic domain, come back, and uh, you know, you can mix the patterns better. So the equality operator, I'm sorry, the unification operator, it's basically, <coughs> if both arguments are initialized, it compares them. Otherwise, the uninitialized one is assigned the value of the other one. Okay, it's simple semantics. This, is, this unification is a little bit different than Polo. Okay. Why, how, let's not go into that. Then, type relation. Type relation is nothing but very similar to boost function. Okay, return boost takes nothing. But the small difference is it only works with function objects, not ordinary function. So basically you have a function object and you can just assign it to a relation. So we've seen these two operators. These operators are themselves relations. They are binary relations. They take two other relations as arguments. So they are, in a sense, higher order relations. Okay? And then you have the exclusive or, the disjunction, exclusive. This is basically similar to your exclusive or operator, but with a small twist that uh, it does short circuit evaluation. Uh, and then there's a take left operator. I'll get into that a little bit later. This, this is something I'm sort of toying around with right now, but this is already out there. So I'm going to be talking about some so-called new stuff which is out there, the beta version of the library, which I think I posted on, uh, posted a link to on the Castor Music, uh, the Boost developers list. Um, so this stuff is already there, uh, these things, and this is kind of new. Still tinkering with that. Only difference of this guy is that his second argument is uh, something slightly different. And we'll get into the semantics. First argument is a relation. Second argument is what's called as a take left relation. Okay, okay so let's look at uh, the all operator. How it's actually implemented. So the all operator is implemented as a coroutine. This is a pseudo syntax here. Okay. I'll show you how the C++ code looks like. So it's job, so for instance when you do something like that, like parent is either father or mother, the OR operator will trigger the evaluation of father as long as it can generate solutions. Okay? And once father fails, he'll move on to mother. So that's all that's happening here. He's triggering the evaluation on the first argument, the first relation and then on the second relation. Now this is the important uh, keyword here, yield. So I've sort of borrowed this syntax from C sharp or maybe even Python or something similar. So when I invoke the parent over here, the first time around, the first evaluation of parent, that will come, then it will end up here. If this succeeds, meaning father succeeds, it returns to back to the caller. But one important thing happens at this point. It remembers this line where execution returns. In subroutines, this doesn't happen. 
subroutines forgets where the return point was. Core routines, the, the callee forgets, but the caller remembers where the transfer happened. Right? The caller remembers where I made the transition to the callee, and then you resume from where the transfer happened when the callee returns. So this state that we're talking about here is stored in the parent the parent relation. <laughs> no, this is the other operator. He remembers where he is in the state. I think it's stored in the stack. So this is father, this is mother. In the second stack. This is father, this is mother. And the other operator is basically putting both of them into action. So it basically remembers that father has been invoked once. I'm right here. Okay, next time. So next time you get back there, it, it, it resumes here. Oh, I need to go back to the while loop. This ha keeps happening till yes. father fails. Okay? And then it moves to this loop. Now, when you keep working on parent further, it will never go here. It will directly resume execution here, stay in this while loop, keep returning true back to the caller. Okay? So do we have two people remember, uh, two things remembering thing? So the, or, the operator has to, re has to remember something. And That's it. The so father relation as well, right? Father, he, he may have to remember his own stuff. If yes. he has multiple, uh, you know. <coughs> so basically they're actually all coroutines. These are all coroutines. <coughs> so, so with this implicit state information, what are the, what are the copy semantics of relations? So when you copy it, the copy remembers where the state was. Okay. So if you take a copy of a relation and try to execute them both, they will both resume from that point. They'll both resume from that point, but independently of each other? Yeah. Just a copy. Yeah. yeah, but you better be careful when you do that because they're both, yeah, independently of each other. No reference to this. They're referencing this. Uh, you know, I might, I might suggest, in, in the, uh, we have a submitted library that never made it to review called the Coroutine Library, right. which has a really good document which describes this whole coroutine thing in detail. And uh, I found it very illuminating, and, and I suspect, I'm, I mean, I'm sure it's dealing with exactly the same. Um, right, actually, I agree the documentation is good. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, the, there's some issues with that implementation. Uh, I, I, that might be I, interesting, I, but... You can talk to me yeah, offline. Yeah. But uh, you'll see the, actually the, the stuff here. But, but so let's well, take a look at how the auto operators... Well, while we're stopped on this point, real quick, I mean, you're talking about submitting this. Have, have you thought about submitting coroutines as an independent... So coroutines as an independent thing, right now this coroutine stuff has been... I understand it fundamentally to the point that the way Castro requires it. And uh, as a more general purpose thing, I think that needs further. Okay. Okay, so what I have here is a little bit more general than the core team that we have in uh, the boost, whatever, in my opinion. You mean a little more general, a little more specific? This is more general. Um, okay. I didn't want to get us off track, but. Uh, uh, it's unclear to me if it is. It might not be. Yeah, if it is, you know. Basically, there's some complexity, simplicity uh, issues. Yeah. But um, basically, I think the coroutine is better implemented in the language rather than the library. Mm -hmm. Because it's a very fundamental concept. Like, just like subroutines, right? Yeah. <coughs> I know. That may be true, but. <laughs> Maybe true, we are not getting it, so yeah. we are stuck with library. Yeah. So, so, so here's a one liner basically, the OR operator. It returns this function object OR. It basically remembers the two arguments, father and mother. And here we have this uh, little function object which is stores the two arguments. And this is where mm -hmm. our code will actually go. Remember, a relation takes no arguments and returns bool. So this guy is uh, inheriting from coroutine. All that coroutine class does is have a um, data member which remembers the state. And now our job is to take that while loop and stick it there. So. Uh, I'm just wondering why OR has template parameters, what would I have besides relations? Why all has template parameters? Well, actually, this has been kept uh, general so that I can expand it uh, 
to not use type eraser. So you actually don't need uh, this here because you can just say relation, relation, left and right. But I'm actually tinkering with uh, the possibility that you don't do type erasure and you get expression templates kind of stuff for some small efficiency. But that's a good observation. So there's two macros at the beginning and the end. Okay, they just introduce a little switch case there. And basically you have the same while loops right there. So exactly the same translation, right? So that's the yield statement, and uh, that's basically it. There's an AND operator, I won't go into this, but you get the idea that there are also core beams. Okay. Then there's the exclusive OR operator, which basically, uh, well, I won't get into it. Uh, it's documented, <laughs> so uh, I, I don't think I have time for actually talking about it. So take left operator, I'll get to this later. This is an interesting operator. It enables some things that are otherwise a little bit difficult in the traditional uh, logic paradigm. So let me get to some examples. So this part of the examples now I'm going to show you is more sort of useful stuff, unlike the Hello World stuff. Okay, just to give you a feel for the things um, that you can do with this paradigm. I'm going to switch over to So what I have here is a simple function, uh, get matching numbers, it takes a range min to max and a predicate. Basically all it does is, you know, goes through this range from min to max and applies this predicate and if the predicate succeeds it adds it to the result and returns it as a list. May not be very efficient to return list in C++, but then the alternatives are very ugly. Too. So but anyway, so that's what we have. Uh, I have a little predicate here, is even, and then I'm just uh, you know using the iterators over here. Uh, after I get all the list back, I'm just running through all the values there. I'm just going to do this uh, declaratively. So what I'm saying is, um, I'm starting using using some relations from Castor. It's sort of you know everything other than that core stuff that I showed you. It's like a standard library for the LP uh, for LP in C++. And these are some relations I'm using. So let's read this. J is in the range one through ten, inclusive range, and J is even. Okay, is even is defined right here, and uh, that's it. Okay, so I'll just run that. So basically you will see both the results, right? The imperative and the declarative stuff. They are the same. Now, uh, I'll just simplify this further. Uh, I'll just say j mod 2 equals equals 0. Okay? And run that. And still the same results. So what's happening here is because this uh, expression involves one logic reference, the operators have been sort of overloaded to you know create a lambda there. And actually they will take all the context that is required so that even when predicate executes in a different context, those values will be available. Okay. So it actually has both, uh, the closure there has both L value and R value semantics for uh, all the L refs you get. Uh, L value semantics and for all the other values you get copies, which is R value semantics. So same deal. What? So now the interesting thing to note is, 
We've actually collapsed. Uh, Should the uh, predicate be removed? The expression uh, uh, with equality could be already a, a relation, isn't it? Oh, this this equality? Yes. No, this two. So this is a fun function object, j mod two, mm -hmm. and that function object equal equal zero is another function object. It's just an expression tree. Yeah, that could be of type uh, relation. No? Oh, is this of type relation? It could be. No. Right. So it's not a coroutine. So it can't be a relation. It's an ordinary function object. So if it were actually one of the ideas I was initially toying with is just having something like that, yeah. right? Exactly. And generate uh, that could be really cool. But the problem happens is this guy is a simple function object, not a relation. Okay, meaning yeah. it doesn't have the coroutine kind of behavior. So I have to be, so meaning you could pass arbitrary functions, function objects there, which is a disaster. If somebody tries to take an ordinary function object and tries to pass there. Yes, but uh, G uh, modulo, modulo 2 is not an ordinary function. It's a function that uh, uh, has been constructed. Uh, so uh, what you're saying is this could have been a relation yeah. instead of a function object. So yeah. that actually design was pursued also. But uh, it appeared that having function objects that need to be passed around was quite uh, a little bit more useful for them. Uh, so that's a whole different discussion, though. But yes, it goes. Is proton you could probably express it like this? I think something like you would have to say, I haven't expressed, I mean. Okay. Okay. No <laughs> <problem. not>. Yeah, <laughs> maybe it is possible. I'm actually working with uh, Eric on some of these okay. potentials. So right now we've looked at the core parts. Uh, it, I don't know, I'm just you know, seeing what, what we can where, you know, whatever makes sense, you could use So anyway, um, so how did we actually, you know, collapse all this uh, code into this one little expression? I mean, if you look at the amount of code we had to write, how did all that collapse in here? Into just this one little expression. <coughs> so the key, uh, okay, besides the fact that we use Lambda and got away with that, there's a, let's revisit this idea of a for loop, a fundamental construct, right? It has a header and a body, but it's very difficult to break out this, uh, decouple these two, the header and the body that's, that's just tightly integrated. Here actually we're trying to do some parameterization of the body by passing it as argument, but still we ended up with a bunch of code. Here, this is actually doing a similar job as the header of the loop, right? And this is basically consuming the value, basically this stuff. So this decoupling actually allows you to write very simple relations and sort of put them together in interesting ways. So for instance, uh, you could do, this would give you This would basically give you a two-level loop, right? And you could three levels or whatever. And then you could consume k here. Basically, predicate has no idea where its values are coming from. Range has no idea where its values are going to. They're just doing their job. Low-level decoupling. Okay. <coughs> So one thing you notice here is that basically we have gotten into the business of writing relations directly as expressions, no functions, right? We just took the expression and that's your uh, relation. Um, so this actually expression, you can think of it as a lambda relation which can be also passed around wherever is needed. And it takes all the context. Basically this is an expression a lambda relation, so to speak, which can be passed around. Okay. So 
next example, okay. The other thing to, uh, other interesting thing, usually it's, you know, when you have things that returns collections, the problem you have is how do you do that? You either could return some iterator objects or maybe a vector. You know, basically, you know, <coughs> you, how do you do it efficiently? Here it's not much of an issue. You just, this guy keeps generating one value at a time and they keep consuming it. So the overall, actually, memory footprint, even if you are uh, working with a range of a million, is just one value, right? You keep rewriting that memory over and over again. Is that really true? Yeah, I believe you, of course. But <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you have somewhere a backtracking point and you have millions of possibilities, it will have. Say that again? As soon as you have insert somewhere a backtracking point. Big? Backtracking point. Big backtracking point, okay. Backtracking point, and you have million of possibilities. It has to so this is a core millions routine. of let's, states. So let's say this, uh, not million states actually. Okay. So this is a core routine. It can generate a million values. But there's only one integer that's holding on to its state. Right? And, and the values for J are being generated in the same location. <coughs> right? And then same thing elsewhere. So basically for the state, you have you know one integer for this thing, and then one for each operator. Mm -hmm. So the one idea about this basically is coming from core things that you only generate how much you need. So if you only, you know, if let's say this is some relation which could be generating a million records. If you're only interested in displaying five, you can stop. You don't need to return everything, right? And the uh, syntax is pretty simple. Let's see how I'm going. A little bit behind. So I'll give you this another one. Pythagoras triplets. So, I'm basically trying to generate all Pythagoras triplets where each number is at the most 30. So, x, y, and z is basically the triplet. I'm saying uh, range x is something between 1 and max, y, same with y, and same with z. And it has to satisfy this predicate. Okay? Very simple to read. I've used. <coughs> Here I flipped the position of x and z so that you get all the 3, 4, 5, 5, 2, 3 kind of combination. And then I'm just uh, evaluating the stuff. So you'll see. So it's generating a bunch of triplets. Now, let's say you just want to decide, you just decide, I want to see all the triplets where the third number is 15, you just have to, you know, uh, say that. And you can keep playing around with that. You know, initializing different ones to whatever. So, so how did you generate all that data? <laughs> So these oh, guys, I see the range, okay, I'm sorry. So okay. range is generating the values and then you're consuming it. So this is almost like a three level loop <laughs> happening there. Like permutation. Yeah. Uh, so now what I'm gonna do you uh, I mean I'm gonna what I'm gonna show you is basically this also works with you know basic ideas like uh, what is this? This is, I think, uh, iterator. So I'm just saying there's another relation called item for enumerating your uh, collections or through using iterator. So you just say i is an item in that uh, range. Okay. So I won't run that. And I think by now you probably believe me. Once you can do iteration, Actually, 
Uh, what I wanted to show you is that you know you could just use pointers instead of those iterators there. So pointers, iterators doesn't matter. Uh, here now that you can you know iterate over basic collections, you can do a little bit more interesting stuff with them. So in this case, I'm actually finding the intersection of the two arrays. Okay. So what I'm saying is I is an item in the first array, J is an item in the second array, and I has to be equal to J. Right? Very straightforward. So we should see 3 and 1. Right? What's the difference between the conceptualize the item and range? The range is just over numbers. <laughs> you specify a min so and max. This is iteration. Do you think you over can, uh, if you sufficiently overloaded it, you think you can use the same array? Well, or iterators you have you you know, pointer semantics. For instance, you have to dereference it to get the value. <coughs> Whereas here, you don't. So the concepts behind the two are <coughs> here is uh, a little bit more than the, the right, but when you have if, value. If I took range, say, and I wanted to call this range, and every time I pass in something that looked like an iterator, I would say, hey, it's an iterator. Uh, sure. But I don't know if it's worthwhile. Right. So. I th uh, yeah, usually people ask me, you know, does the range also do iterator? And those just semantics look different to me because a value, you know, you okay, for instance, you can pass a pointer, but you want, uh, you want value semantics. You want to, you know, like, you don't want to lose that. Yeah, you don't want that. Stuff. So sometimes you have these ambiguities. Yeah, that's true. Um, Did you, have you read Alice and Rescue's? Uh, you know, must go and range oh, and last time, yeah, I think we have this. Uh, so they will definitely, uh, you will see the iterators <coughs> diminishing a bit. Uh, that seems like some overlap there. Yeah. yeah, so actually, we can simplify this further. We can get rid of this predicate and just say, uh, you know, i is in the first array and in the second array also. Right? Much more simpler. So the first one will generate the value, second one will consume it. Because of the bi directional nature, it's going to test actually. But on the other hand, this, what you just did was you just created what is it, in, a, in essence set intercept. Yes. Yes, I mean yes. that's that. I mean our, our, right. So I, I can see that's the interesting because you could actually create some very interesting set relationship functions by by this uh, technique as well. Sure. Here it just happens that some of the stuff I'm you know you may need some other operators or whatever. Uh, like for instance, uh, we have only four operators and they have some particular uses. Uh, in this particular case, I was able to use AND to get the intersection semantics. Uh, you could, you know, potentially change the behavior of, you know, you could use some other relation <coughs> over here instead of AND and probably get some other semantics. No, no, I'm, I'm, no what I'm suggesting is, is that that's fine. For any set relationship, it's just changing the predicate. So I can say yeah, yeah. I is equal to J. Yeah, so it's one, almost like you're, kind yeah. of an instant you're almost instant. issuing queries over your data structure at this point. Yeah. You yeah. can filter stuff out. You can you know, take the stuff, filter all the stuff that you don't want, and then transform them into something else, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. so forth. So you'll see some more of that later. Uh, so now actually, what will this give me? Um, A union, right? Now union actually... Uh, so let's see the result. So here, what's happening is the values are repeating some of them, 3 and 1 for instance, the duplicate. <coughs> now, I said, if you remember, that set may or may not be unique. Uh, so if you want to get rid of that, <coughs> you just say, you basically just ask for unique i. Right, you're saying I is in both of them and <coughs> unique. So now if I run that, uh, you see they're gone. Right? And uh, you can do more interesting <laughs> things. <laughs> Yes. So unique, as, as, as unique keeps getting the values, it remembers the old one so that it can double check that if the value has come previously. It's very unique. Huh? It's very unique. It is unique. Actually, this is not normally done in uh, logic paradigm because they don't keep state. Yeah. But in C++, we can say to hell with that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, OK, 
Okay, so this little uh, sim simplification I have, which I really like. Uh, <laughs> so here, uh, here what I'm doing is, uh, you know, saying, you know, why do I have to keep saying begin and begin and all the time? Uh, so if you have a logic reference to a vector, you can just say I is an item in that vector. Okay, and that. <coughs> So you basically, you know, you don't have to keep saying. So you can see the iterators are now sort of diminishing. Uh, and of course, uh, one there's a relation where you want to write all it, take a collection and just write it. And you can specify delimiters, dominators. Uh, so for instance, let me just print out those two relations. Okay saying write all in the, I'm just triggering the evaluation right away. You can see it's put delimiters in the middle, not at the end, right? This is not what you get with the STD copy. It will always put that stuff to come at the end. So it's smart about that. And then there's a default slash n at the end. You can just override those, you know, with whatever, colon separated followed by two new lines or whatever. So, <clears throat> this expression, notice what we're doing. We are starting from an iterator, okay? I mean, starting from a container, filtering out the events, transforming the those into basically, I'm saying J is the square of I, right? And then finally writing it out. So. A collection is a sequence of values are coming out from here. A sequence of values are being consumed and produced by this algorithm or whatever is here and is going to an output stream all without iterating. Because we've just said everything is a relation. So containers, algorithms, you know, IO streams, whatever. I'm 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 not understanding when you say write why you have to have the J parameter there. What do you want to write? <laughs> you could write just hello there, right? I see. Yeah. Okay. And actually, you can do it a little bit better because. And then you get a hello again, for every know, match. You can actually write function objects out because yeah. you can say J followed by you know plus two or something like that. Usually, it's more useful with strings. If J is a string, then you can put a space after that, for instance. Can you convert J to a string and then add a space after it? Uh, you could do something like that. You can write a little function which just says cast it to a you know, to a, to a string or something like that. So there's a facility to do this, very simple. Uh, that will do the job. So say you printed out hello only. Okay. How many times would that? Yeah. Well, so this one, okay, let's just print that. <coughs> so just the same as the previous. No difference. You just, uh, you know, every time J, there's a J coming out from that other pipeline, you just write in color. Okay, even though that J isn't really used. Yeah, he doesn't care. Yeah. Let's check. So they're completely decoupled, so they have no, you know, they're just doing their little job in the pipeline. Um, Okay, so I'll get to some more interesting stuff now. <laughs> so the, the, the take left operator, I, I, I didn't have a better name, so that's what it's called, the take left. What it does, it's an operator that takes a relation and what's called as a TLR, take left relation. Unlike ordinary relations, these TLRs, they actually take an argument as a relation at evaluation time. Usually with normal uh, relations, this argument is not given. Okay, so that's the only difference between a TLR. So why do we need this? So yeah, I, I think of. Uh, I think we we kind of might call that apply in this other stuff we've been using, or would we not? Uh, yeah, but what are you applying to? Well, this is the apply part. Yeah, that's what I mean. But uh, everyone is applying something, with or without an argument. 
So even if you're not passing an argument, it's an apply. Okay. So there are some of these uh, categories of relations like sorting, which cannot produce a value or a result until they've seen the whole input sequence. Right? Mm -hmm. You cannot, uh, for instance, reverse a sequence until you see, see the whole sequence. Same with sum. If you want to total the sum, you cannot say what the sum is until you've seen the whole stuff. So this basically gives you gives these relations an opportunity to sort of milk all the values out of the other relation, you not know, do whatever with them, and then produce the result. You can do without this operator, but the syntax is a little bit ugly because you just have to do this kind of you know sort and pass an item relation there, and that could be a complex relation. Okay, there's just a syntactic sugar. So, <coughs> it's a simple way of producing values in an sorted order. Right? I is in the vector, and you want an order. This is interesting. You see how it works? <coughs> You're just saying, you know, give me all the all the values from 1 to 5. Just come from the factor of and just reducing it down to put the multiplication of it. So, sorry, can you go back to that last thing? Does the, does the factorial value end up in n? Yes. So, <laughs> so basically, this is an in and out. A very good observation. <coughs> Meaning, the values are generated here. He, he, he takes them all up, he sucks all the values out, and then n has no purpose at that point. So instead of having another argument where we can uh, sort of do something with n. But you're going to call into the reduce for every one in the range, right? <coughs> and what, yeah, what when he basically does is he gets this whole relation at the time of evaluation, this whole thing, you know, it's passed in here. And then he'll keep uh, evaluating this guy. In this while loop. Oh, I see. So I see. And then he he will do whatever processing is required. Maybe multiply. So so, so it, it it's almost like, uh, and I guess maybe this is on the slide. It's it's sort of a lazy evaluation of the range, passing it into the reduce to be evaluated within yes. the reduce. Got gotcha. it. Right. So he keeps multiplying the values and storing it. He doesn't need to store the whole sequence. Right. Then sort of reverse. need to keep the whole sequence around. So you could also do it with a slightly earlier syntax. You just take this whole guy and pass him as an argument, and it's just. Uh, uh, in the sorting case, mm -hmm. where is the result stored? I. I is. I is ordered. So declaratively, declaratively, what you're saying is I is in the vector, and you want it ordered. So I, this vector is not modified. Uh -huh. Okay, order stores it internally. However. He'll just produce the values in sorted order. So normally when you say item i, i is a type a vector item. Yeah, yeah. But in, but in the string order. But now you're saying i is a type vector. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to produce. In so for the next guy in the chain. Uh, while you do a while, okay. you can iterate uh, over right. the sorted values. The next guy. Like one at a time. If you don't want all of them, you can stop at the first the Right. Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because that opens up the idea of incremental sorting. You know, only as if you if you're only going to need five, then why bother sorting? But right now, this is not doing any lazy sort because the algorithms I toyed with were not any better. Does this have a prolog counterpart, or is it unique to prolog? Well, in prolog, what you would have to do is you take this whole thing and pass it as an argument, a third argument, to this relation. Explicitly, right? So this could be a huge expression. So it would look really ugly if you. Oh, so it's mostly a syntactic sugar. My favorite is group by. So you can take. Uh, we have simple functions. They're given a string and returns me the first character, or in other case, it returns me the length. Then let's say we have a vector of numbers, strings. Like one, two, three. I say the group, this is the nature of the grouping I'm interested in, okay? I want to take these uh, <coughs> strings and group them by their first character. So all the ones starting with O will be grouped in one, everything starting with T will be grouped in another one. 
the single level grouping. So once I specified the nature of the grouping, I basically enumerated, and this is the relation which does the job. I'm saying group n using first character into G. Um, <coughs> is there <coughs> an alternative syntax you would use that would be <coughs> equivalent to using this operator? <coughs> yeah, so oh. the equivalent syntax would have to be you take this whole relation and provide it as a fourth argument there. And, and that's in the line, if that's in, I mean, it's an alternative that exists or an alternative that you decline to include? Uh, so there's a couple of ways. What you can do, and in the way it's currently designed, you can open uh, the function call operator uh -huh. and uh, Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, it, it. Or the other way is to hand. And, and personally, actually, I, I would find that more intuitive than you, using the op operator. To, mm -hmm. to start with, it's very odd to me that it looks kind of like an assignment, and our assignments almost always end up, uh, the result ends up on the left hand side. And here, it seems like that's different than what we're used to. I chose this operator because nobody understands what it probably is. It's just a right shift. With <laughs> nobody uses it. So you, you can take one of those operators and make your life simpler. Meaning you could put that stuff there, but uh, you'll have to keep track of it. Basically, you'll have to assign. The syntax is not that great. Yeah. I mean, well, these writing? things are question of taste in large part. Right. So, you know, I'm just kind of giving you the benefit of yeah, what my taste really is. I really right? sweat my blood on making sure the syntax is really clean. <laughs> yeah. you know, as, you know, but in any way, let's suppose that one just liked the other one, you could just, the other one's all already in there supported, right? Right, you could just, you know, take that stuff here. Yeah, and, and use the call you know, operator. Call yeah. operator, you can ignore the... Yeah. So this is a single level grouping. Uh, so what I'm doing here is triggering this evaluation and saying write all items in G. So that's it, <coughs> right, simple stuff. And I'm getting the key, so basically I print the key for that particular group and then all the items in that group. So each time this succeeds, you get one group, like one O, <coughs> one T's, you know, and so forth. What is the value of string S in? Oh, it shouldn't be there. Because <coughs> uh, you can also do, I used to do some stuff like this. You can also just say item S in G. So that gives you the ability, so that's probably from where it was. Also, the string length function uh, doesn't seem to be used in here. We'll get there. So, so now I'm going to do two level grouping. First by the first character, and then by the length, right? Uh, okay. First, by the grouping, the type of the group is character is the first key. The second level grouping is, we just nest it, right, by the length and then the actual object. So, I specified the first level grouping, group this by so and so, then by so and so. And you can keep doing dot then, dot then. As long as the number of dot then are matching with the number of nested groups. Okay? So you can't specify five if there's only two level grouping. So I get the outermost group, right? And then get into the, I have to, so I got G, which is, you know, a set of O's, let's say. And then I'm going to go through each subgroup here. G2 is a subgroup of G, and write all G2, right? So basically you can start see, I don't know how many of you, you'll have uh, any experience with link or C sharp or... So you can start seeing that, you know, fundamental query operations are possible in C, C++. So syntax is a little bit different. Maybe extra function call operators, idle. Yeah? yeah. Oh, this is basically instead of saying relation write all and then triggering write all, I just do it in one go. I mean, I could have left this stuff out, uh, you know, relation x is equal to that, and then y or whatever. So instead of that, it's just, you know. Okay. So
So, here's another one. This is mostly uh, just for fun. Uh, not going to replace Boost Graph this week? What was that? It's not going <laughs> to replace Boost Graph this week? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you could use those iterators and I guess. Uh, let's see how I'm doing. I have a very interesting example, but I don't, I don't know how much time I have. Okay, so anyway, I'll just show you. I'm just representing the graph declaratively. This is one way to do it. There's multiple ways to do this stuff. So I'm saying uh, 1, comma 2 is an edge, 2, comma 3 is an edge. This is the basic graph. <coughs> path is defining what is a path. I'm saying... <coughs> Start to end is a path. Okay? That's the declarative reading here. We're saying start to end is a path if start to end is an edge. Or start to some node x is an edge. And from there you recursively find the it's just like the answers to relation. Okay? So given that given that actually now because the arguments are bidirectional, you can say you can check if something is a path by fixing the value. You can say, you know, if you give one to start, then it will generate all the ones that are reachable from one. And same way, you know, if I pass uh, four to end and leave this unspecified, you get all the reverse stuff. Right? Yeah. <laughs> path, path is just saying what is a path. That's just information. And then you use it in different ways. Something more interesting in a sense that you would probably use this kind of stuff more often is because you actually have an imperative definition, some class tree, let's say. And you want sort of a member relation which has an item relation. Basically it's enumerating. Right? Uh, I'm not sure if I want to explain this, but uh, <laughs> it's actually very simple. But it's using C++ OX. It's creating a lambda. So basically this guy, this item relation, he returns the score routine which is implemented as a lambda. Okay? And let's just see what's happening here. You see those macros here. Go begin and end. And then you're saying iterate all the stuff from the left recursively. This is, I think, uh, pre-order traversal, no, in-order traversal. So first generate all the items in the left subtree, <coughs> unify with the current value, and then move on to the right subtree. This is more of an imperative definition, not a declared one. Okay? Meaning I could just have returned some function object, I just simplified it with this. One thing I had to do for this is, you know, define this little state so that it can be used by these macros. And since they are modifying this value, so I'm back to the mutable, meaning it can change state. So this uh, simply point also remembers the state at the point it left and comes back? Yeah, because it's a function object. Every time you trigger the function object, it always remembers the... No, there are any local variables, like stack state. You don't want to put locals inside Correct. the operator. Mm. Unless it's okay to throw them away. Mm. So it just remembers where it left. And does it remember the... the it's left? a switch case, right. and there's a case where it uh, basically... Yeah, but like, does it remember the counter of the while loop? So that it can... No, no, it doesn't need a counter. It just needs the point where... Uh, the Basically, the little line of code where, you know... It'd be tempting to see the, <coughs> all the macro the Oh, yeah, it's about five lines or ten lines. To see it, what it would look like. <coughs> what does it generate for macro uh, Let's see. I have it documented somewhere. Uh, it's actually, I can just show it to you, uh, dynamic relations, maybe I want to skip this stuff. Um, if you really want to see what... So here's your, uh, here's those four macros, you begin, end, and you. Okay, and that's the code being class. So that's, all. it's just setting up a switch state now. Okay, don't try to internalize this now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'll skip this part about dynamic relations. I don't have time for this. 
basically you can build uh, these clauses dynamically so um, the last part of the demo <coughs> So what I have here is a game of chess, right? Um, now, the first part of my you know demos were all hello world stuff. Second was some more interesting examples. Here I'm more interested in design aspects, okay, not about you know implementation of some uh, particular functionality. So I have two implementations of this piece of program, an imperative uh, like a standard OO style one, and another one is more multi paradigm. Now, I'm just going to contrast the basic, you know, these are not gold standard implementations just to get your, you know, brain thinking a little bit. So if you were to abstract, you know, this, whatever you see here, a very natural <coughs> over representation would be, you know, a class for each type of, you know, stuff you see on the board. Each piece will have some class, maybe a class for the board, maybe something for the cell, which knows how to paint itself, so forth. So the basic idea here is that uh, of this design is that when I take this piece and move it here, it's invoking a valid move method on it, giving it the new position. And the piece returns true or false based on its own rules, saying if that's a you know a legitimate <coughs> move, and then if it's true, then we actually move the piece. Okay. So I'm going to just show you the an overview of this code. Um, so I'll first show you the basic OO structure. Uh, so if so, if you look at this class uh, viewer, right? You basically. You see each type, a bishop, a board, you know, a bishop, a uh, king, knight, that's each piece that you know, goes on the board. And then there's, so it's a very simple, there's nothing complex about this, right? I'm, I'm just dying to know, does it play against you? It does not. Okay, so you could write that, but it wasn't demonstrating anything. This is mostly for, you know, just two players playing, and it only enforces the rules. Okay? So which is why it's quite simple. Actually, building the intelligence is something, I mean, even I'm not a good chess player. I think <laughs> many people have pointed out that uh, the king and the queen are in the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> not in the right. So, I don't think I should be even writing something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, the rook, <clears throat> let's take your rook, okay? I mean, if you don't know what chess is, uh, don't bother. I mean, it's some random board game. And there's, a bunch of, <laughs> and there's a bunch of pieces on any board game, and they all have rules, and, you know, that's all that you can at a high level. Uh, so we've got the rook here. And uh, it has a sort of a... It derives, from, I guess, okay, let's just look at his members. It has a valid move... Uh, it has a valid move thing, which returns true or false and it takes the new position. Now, I'll just show you the basic, uh, I guess I'll just show you the quick uh, uh, overview of how it's done. Uh, I'm basically interested in checking if it's a valid move to the right, I mean if it's a horizontal move, or it's a vertical move. Those are the only two uh, kinds of moves that are possible for a rope. So, I'm checking if it's a horizontal move here, Either it's a horizontal move or it's a vertical move. If it's neither of them, it will return false at the bottom. Okay, and um, there's just some loops uh, looking at the adjacent. Uh, so let's look at the slightly uh, MP version of this. Um, so here's the rook class. And uh, now, so this 
is the part that is of interest. So it has the same uh, valid move method. It's actually a pure virtual function in the base class. Okay, so you can treat all the pieces polymorphically. Um, and then you have this new one called, which is actually a member relation now. And uh, it actually takes the stuff split out, like the row and the column, basically. Okay, it gives you some flexibility once you do that. So let's take a look at that valid move. Uh, Okay, so what I'm saying here is either it's a horizontal move or it's a vertical move. Very quickly, easily can check that by looking at the new positions with the current one. Right. So you're checking that and then you're checking if it's a valid move to the left or the right, valid move up or down in case it's a vertical move. And then there's some relations which look at if it's a valid move up or down. So the code internally is not of interest, but what it gives you is more interesting. Uh, since the, okay, let's see this uh, old function, the member function which actually used to return true false. Right, now it's actually implemented in terms of this relation. Right, you, you just uh, invoke the relation and trigger it right away, because this is a pure test. Test only. It only checks if it's a valid move, right? So you can, this gives you bidirectional arguments, which means you can also generate or test. So here we're using that in test mode. And we actually got this generative mode, which is quite interesting because what you can do then is ask a piece which are all the locations that it can move to. If you just leave the arguments unspecified, you can also fix just the row or the column and then give you all sorts of, you know. So, you can see that actually over here, if I were to show moves, there's a little checkbox there saying show moves. So, if I were to point at this piece here, right, it's giving me the locations where it can go to. So, it's just using the generative aspect. So for a game programmer it's quite interesting because this problem of uh, iterating all moves is comparatively much more, uh, you know, relatively more complicated than simply saying if you can go from point A to point B, right? And uh, once you have the ability to iterate all moves for one piece means you also have it for all other pieces. Then you can build this intelligence engine which looks at all the moves and says which one is the best. And you know, you can... So, did you implement the like collision detection? For example, a knife has <coughs> pieces, but a rope is bounded by pieces? Yeah. Okay. So basically, those relations will actually examine each of those uh, nearby cells, right? Either it can, it'll either ignore those, if it can actually hop over them, it simply ignores those cells, it just goes and looks at the destination. So. so and this captures all the, pa the capture rules as well, and the songs and all that? I haven't implemented it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, n% I haven't implemented because uh, I just have to stick some state in the, each piece, remembering, you know, what's the situation. and So the logic is a little bit more work, meaning you have to put some state in. I haven't bothered it because my real intent intention here, you can definitely implement that. But the only situ reason is, it's, I said, okay, no. Uh, but n percent and that one is a little bit more work. Mm -hmm. Actually, in either case, I'm, and this is all the logic is here, including fix. <coughs> it was actually implemented in C++ because so they have some, you know, GUI stuff, uh, which, so I didn't have to you know, write a lot of code. Now the original version. The original version actually is about a thousand lines of code. So you cut down a significant source code base, but you you know expanded your functionality at the same time. And uh, so I think that's kind of cool because it's not that this is a great you know gold standard design or something, but uh, 
what a paradigm can bring once you start, you know, mixing it with your existing stuff uh, in a very free flow format. I think that's a very powerful. So let me conclude with uh, a little. It's a pure header library. Currently, the beta is out, which is uh, sort of a pre beta actually, but those compilers are supported, and there's an earlier version with some other compilers. And uh, this is a maybe I think I'm out uh, 10 minutes over which I think is reasonable for a boost talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so maybe I'll take a couple of questions and, and discuss after that. I'm, I'm just wondering, like, full on, like, is there anything that they use the logic paradigm now that is like a major field? Actually, I am per, I myself have not been pursuing the, the state of the art there. And what it seems like somehow functional programming has started seeping into the, uh, you know, a lot of spaces and sort of cloggling the logic paradigm over. Um, logic paradigm and functional paradigm, because of their purity, I think they remained sort of in a niche. But I think once we start opening up into a multi paradigm domain, I personally feel that, you know, there's more used to. Uh, it's better to be multi paradigm than puristic O or puristic. Whatever. Um, there are several languages. Godel is one. There's Parlor, where there's something interesting I can point out over here in some of these examples. So just think of this uh, relation, this set of clauses. Do you see any implicit parallel? Info, uh, any in implicit information about parallelizing that? Okay. The or. You see in the normal code, this information is very difficult to extract. Here you can see that you know each class could be potentially done in parallel. Right? So it, parallel is taking one of those approaches for parallelization. Uh, that's <coughs> called or parallelization. There's also and parallelization. So did I? Uh, excuse me. Um, you know, uh, now, I, I know that the answer is use of those graph lines. I, I know mm -hmm. they've heard. However, it, what's interesting to me is that you've got a static, statically built structure, and and I'm just wondering, is there any mechanism for building it dynamically? Yeah, so that, I just have the data, for example. Yeah, I mean. skipped that part. Uh, uh, here, this is actually building a graph dynamically. So there's a class called disjunctions. And uh, basically, I'm re so let's say this vector huh? has a set of edges. So I'm iterating over that vector and generating a bunch of clauses here and pushing it back onto. So this is a good example of using relations as sort of lambda. You're kind of taking this uh, expression and sort of putting it away in a vector <coughs> conceptually. And you build these clauses up. And sorry. then, you know, this is, this, there's also conjunctions and uh, whatever. So this is the sort of the disjunctive normal form, uh, so to speak. Is it but mechanical B? Yeah, it has a, I know that's a bad <laughs> Yeah, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't realize I was ever going to get into boost or either I'll come here or something like that. So anyway, I know for boost it's an issue. So, so basically that guy, he takes away all the, you know, whatever, my, whatever closure he needs and this is sort of assert in prologue, no? Say that again? Assert. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In prologue, uh, by and large, you can take any relation and start dumping extra clauses into it. Yeah. Which is kind of dangerous in my opinion. Because we want to re we want to be able to reason about our functions or relations. So if yeah. you if you want open ended relations then you can publish this disjunction globally and people can sort of you know add clauses into it. And often it's necessary. What's that? It's often necessary. Yeah, in that case you should do that. Yeah. I, I, ha I have to apologize for my crack about prologue. This is really much nicer than prologue. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. You just saved him six months of work. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So you actually don't have any interpreter behind the scenes, actually. That's the biggest. Uh, there's no prologue engine behind. That's just those two. No, no, of course not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's called. So there are a couple of libraries which try to do that by you know giving you a. 
full blown engine and you no, have to I mean, sort of interact why, with that. The uh, reason why we don't see prologue is it's so dog slow and it doesn't solve any real problems. What are, what are your compile time and runtime? Uh, actually, so compile time is a tricky thing. I can never measure that. Uh, uh, for instance, the I can show you a full period of the entire test suite of... Uh, of course, we've been watching him compile yeah, the yeah. examples, so that yeah, kind of gives yeah. you a, a so taste. So, for instance, I just issue a reader of uh, the whole test suite, and that's a lot of test cases there. So, as I... Can you see that? So, that's not a problem. <laughs> it's not too bad, because right now I'm using type erasure, as opposed to, you know, letting the... Uh, I don't know if it will change. Sometimes compiler that people to say, you know, you think it should be faster than it just work. I, I, I got to congratulate you for, for typing code during the demo. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. That, that takes a lot of balls. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that was because, you know, you have to get a little bit of hands on feel when you work with a new pattern, and that was very important for me. Uh, so, one more question, and when did we will be in boost? Oh, you know, once they beat me up thoroughly and then they think, okay, this guy is <laughs> about to die, let's leave him. So I think, well, I, I think people are going to ask for lazy evaluation. Uh, lazy evaluation is already... Well, okay, I didn't it's see really, it. It's really lazy. Huh? It's this is all lazy evaluation. So, actually, in, in relation to that question about when it's going to be induced, I think you had a conversation with me earlier, and I think this might be a good audience to bring this up. You were looking for a review manager, right? Uh, actually, not right now. I was just trying to figure out what the process is. Say yes. well, well, but, 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 but wait, yes. but wait. Yes. 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 <laughs> You're looking for a review manager at some point in the future when this is ready. So, yes. you know, if there's somebody in this room that has, you know, good expertise in this area, you know, we, we, you need to find a volunteer. So, of course, you can ask on the list as well, but... Yeah. So, play with it a little bit, and your help will be very useful because actually uh, I am not much of a... I haven't been using Boost much at all because I don't... When I work, it's all C stuff. Uh, so I don't ever see any C++ programmer until I come to a conference. Uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah, I have a lot of holes in my understanding of the documentation system, the you know test system, everything in Boost. And so if people are able to sort of you know, give me the right directions or help out with the stuff, whatever it is. You don't, you don't really need to have all those things cleared up to have a review. Yeah. So my understanding was that I need to get the whole test subsystem ported into the Boost stuff. The whole documentation stuff. No, it, just get it so that somebody can run tests, like, you know, like this, run, compile the... Yeah. Compile the, app of the test application and run, you know, just get it so that people can do it, and that's, that's enough to do a review. Okay, because I got some feedback on the list saying, oh, you got to do this, that, and the other. Then you got the wrong feedback. Well, sorry. Well, well, I have <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 sorry. No, I apologize. But now, now, we, now we know your personality and stuff. We got the new list. You know. Oh, that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. The standards might, might change if you give, give a talk at the boost come like this. The standards <laughs> might change. The standards. So I mean, well, it'll be harder or I easier. I think there's time for looking at the standards. This has to, you know, send out a little bit, uh, uh, get I mean, some more. Uh, I can, it's I very can. convincing. Yeah, I think the pattern is quite convincing. It's very, you know, you don't have to get into the whole pattern to start using it. Simple enumeration of stuff, you know, it's so much more nicer than Maybe that should be maybe that should be a, a criteria for going into boost is that you have to give a talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a good idea. I should say your whole way of exposing it too was very helpful. You know, kind of like sucked in one little finger at a time. <laughs> well, you know, it's just a, I mean the first example you know were like five lines you know and we could all grasp it and then kind of built on that was very helpful. I, I would actually use this. Um, I have some set relations that are, that are difficult to compose with the five set uh, operators in the SQL. And I have some other things that would actually be quite useful. Uh, just very little, minimal, little couple yeah, of relations. Yeah. 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 And yeah. so, how do I get this again? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, NPProgramming.com? Um, I'm going to assume it's going to take a year to get this boost. Uh, so you can either send me an email or uh, basically go to this uh, Right now, this is not this beta stuff is not published. Uh, I'm just you know whoever I talk to, I just tell them about it. Uh, the one that's actually uh, 
You mean so the way it's worked uh, by nobody else knows about it? Uh, yeah, it's only for you that is. Uh, this stuff, okay, this is publicly available, 1.0. Uh, some of the interesting stuff is right here, but this is beta. So, and uh, there's also those uh, documentation I've written, it's useful. The, the beta versions cover, you know, this is also not published. So, this is there on the Boost developers list. I have a link of all of this stuff. Uh, you know, my very first post saying, is there interest in Castro has all these links. Uh, if you have any issues, just email me and I can come to you. Are you on the boost developer list? Uh, yeah. We're not on the developer list. Mm -hmm. Are you able to browse it through then you use the Yes. So you should be, you might be able to find it. Or just send me an email and I can use it. So start simple and you know, don't bother about it. There's a lot of techniques involved in the pattern. We're just scratching the surface. Yeah. I myself am exploring the pattern in this library. So even I, I don't know what's the extent. Because usually it takes a while to you know for a paradigm to settle down. Even today people are having arguments about the object-oriented paradigm. So this is, I mean, it's been so many years. So start simple, see what works, see what doesn't work. Um, as you probably noticed, Bruce kind of caught up with me, and I. I was out for most of this talk. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're only ten minutes over. Store, though, sort of. <laughs> no, me too. Uh, uh, so, uh, did did you do any speed testing? So my I haven't done I have done very little performance work on this. It has always been my sort of hope to sort of get it to a point before I start uh, <coughs> doing the performance work and tweak this stuff. Uh, so one of the things I'm looking at, uh, you know, I was talking to Eric about that. Um, so I think there's a phase when I'll have to start just looking at the performance issues where they are. Right now there's dynamic dispatch happening. So that's one of the performance potential issues if you care about performance in that section of your code. Oh yeah. Uh, so, right? Mm -hmm. So you, but there's, uh, sometimes you suddenly get that efficiency from the fact that it uses, you know, the same amount of memory to do all the values, which saves you a bunch of efficiency because you never go to malloc or free. Mm -hmm. The allocator, which is a huge cost. Mm. So, nevertheless, there's work to be done in the performance, and uh, I think that phase will come.